Welcome to Cal CPA Brain Food Bites. I'm Annette Nellen, a professor at San Jose State University and a frequent speaker for Cal CPA, particularly for year end updates, which I do with Greg Kling. And we start those about mid November and have an eight hour session on individuals, another eight hour session on um, businesses and estates. I'm just giving you a short uh, update here about a couple of things, mainly tied to digital assets. Well, the first item here is Around July, we typically see changes coming from the IRS on their draft forms for the next year. And I do want to highlight this one, actually two items here on Schedule 1. At the very top of the form, they have this narrative. And what it says is, for 2024, enter the amount reported to you on Form 1099-K that was included in error or for personal items sold at a loss, which are items, of course, that wouldn't go on your return, uh, but they want to know that amount, I think helping them reconcile your 1099Ks, perhaps. Then it says, note, the remaining amounts reported to you on Form 1099K should be reported elsewhere on your return, depending on the nature of the transaction. And some of those actually might go on Schedule 1. Of course, we don't have the draft instructions yet. Hopefully, they'll lay out a little bit more of what they're trying to do here. But I think it's trying to get at reconciling 1099Ks. And while the American Rescue Plan Act enacted in March 2021 dropped the threshold of when a third party settlement organization such as PayPal has to issue a 1099K. Uh, They dropped it to where um, instead of issuing one, if they process payments for somebody that were more than $20,000 for the year and more than 200 transactions, Congress dropped it to as long as it's over $600 that PayPal or Venmo or other third party settlement organization processed for somebody where they got those payments for providing goods or services, uh, the IRS postponed that due date and we're keeping the old threshold. But for 2024, the threshold was instead of over 600, it was over 5,000. They haven't said yet what the threshold is that they're gonna follow for 2025. I'm guessing it's gonna go to 600, but they certainly are expecting that there were gonna be more 1099Ks. Of course, any third party settlement organization can follow the statutory threshold of over $600, um, which I'm guessing some of them do. Uh, The other new item on Schedule 1 is Line 8V, and Line 8 itself is a long line of specific items that are other income, and it says digital assets received as ordinary income, not reported elsewhere. It sounds like a good idea to put that there because somebody may have received virtual currency from staking or mining, or maybe they did little micro tasks. I know uh, at least one exchange often will send, hey, if you do this tutorial, it takes 15 minutes and we'll give you, you know, uh, three units of new XYZ coin. Of course, it's probably worth about a dollar or two, but it is income. <laughs> and you report it on that line uh, 8V and then we'll wait for the instructions. That's just one item I wanted to show you. But talking about digital assets, another major change that happened November 2021 in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was to say that Section 6045 on broker reporting, and 6045 is a code section that causes there to be a 1099B on securities transactions, that broker would be broadened to include brokers of digital assets, and there's a definition of digital asset there. And that was supposed to start really for 2023, but it's a massive project for the IRS to get the uh, guidance out, trying to figure out even what Congress was getting at, what are all of the types of uh, digital asset transactions that should be covered, who all should be a broker. Like we have custodial brokers where they actually hold your digital asset. We also have non-custodial brokers. Well, IRS determined, for example, that yeah, even those non-custodial brokers are also brokers, uh, but they are deferring. Uh, they're going to get more guidance out later on those. But we didn't get any proposed regs until uh, mid-2023. We didn't even see a draft 1099 DA for digital assets until April of this year. And then in late June, they released the final regulations that came along with some other items, which were two notices and a rep proc. And let me just briefly mention um, the notices. You should take a look at it. I got that link on the prior slide that will get you into a fact sheet that has all the links and a brief explanation. In our limited amount of time, I want to mainly highlight if you have clients that own digital assets and every year they do a variety of transactions, you know, buying, selling and all that. And you've been calculating, you know, like on Form 8949 showing gains and losses from these uh, capital assets that they have. Um, If they have been tracking the basis 
Following the IRS FAQs that were released in October of 2019, and it's mainly FAQs 39 to 41, where the IRS was basically saying, um, gee, I sold two units of XYZ coin out of my wallet, but I'm going to really say, so far as tracking the basis, it was really the ones I sold were out of my other wallet, and I'll use that basis. And that's what we would call the universal approach where you weren't identifying it wallet by wallet or account by account, but looking at any wallet or account that you had. And the FAQs did not disallow that, but seemed to imply that was fine. And certainly the IRS is well aware that some of the, that probably all of the companies that provide software for tracking your digital asset transactions were allowing that universal approach. Some might also have allowed tracking by wallet or um, account, but uh, I, I, I chair the AICPA Digital Asset Task Force, and we've been around since about 2015. And we had submitted comments on the proposed regs. And one of the things we were looking at, because we weren't commenting on, gee, what's exactly a broker? What exactly is a digital asset? We were both focused on, we know other people would comment on those. What are CPAs going to do when they get these 1099 DAs? What is going to be any problems they have with them? And one of the things we highlighted, and we maybe were one of the few to highlight it, was your regs, which cover not just 6045, but also basis under Section 1012 and amount realized under Section 1001, are saying you must use a wallet by wallet or account by account to track. So if I sell, you know, maybe in the past, I've five times I bought coin XYZ. So I got five allotments and they're all in my one wallet. Well, when I, under the final regs, if I sell a few of those units, I can specifically identify where it came from, or I could use, you know, a, a HIFO approach, but I have to stick by the wallet. Well, that's going to be a problem if, let's say instead it was my Coinbase account where I'd already said in my records, oh, when I sold some XYZ out of my own wallet, I'm going to pretend it was really using the basis out of the Coinbase wallet. Well, someday when I actually do sell the coin out of Coinbase, they don't know that I've already used that basis. So there would be just problems. So what the IRS came up with was at the end of 2024, people who have been using this universal tracking approach to know their basis uh, would have to basically identify at the end of the year, how much do you have of unused basis? And it, it, it's fairly complicated, there's no doubt about that, but actually our task force has come to be meeting every week to go over uh, this, trying to figure out, because one of the things we like to do is provide some resources to AICPA uh, members on what do you need to do, because you need to do also something by year end. There's also a few uh, things that aren't quite clear in the Rev Prox, so we're probably going to send the comment letter off to the, um, to the IRS, but it's basically what they're having you do, identify what are your units of unused basis. Well, the best way to get through this is let me give you an example. And there's five examples in the regulations. Let me go over these first three. Okay, so the first one is um, that B, who is the taxpayer, holds 10 units of digital asset DE in an, in an unhosted wallet, I mean, in his own wallet, and he's calling it XYZ. That's the wallet name. He acquired those in June, sorry, July 2019 at a dollar each. He also has 20 units of digital asset DE in his GHI wallet, and he acquired those in September 2020 at $5 per unit. Now, in example one, he sells all these units before the end of the year. Okay, so he's done. There's nothing for him to do. He doesn't have anything to allocate because he doesn't have these coins anymore. But those facts become relevant as they're carried over to example two. Okay, so in example two, um, instead of selling them in 2024, he sells just six units and he takes them out of his XYZ wallet but he assigns the basis because in 2024, uh, he's still allowed to use the FAQ universal approach as opposed to an account by account, wallet by wallet identification of what you sold. So he in his records B decides, well, even though I took the six units out of XYZ wallet and sold those, which have a dollar basis, I'm instead gonna assign the $5 basis that I have in my GHI wallet for these DE units. So. What happens is at the start, let me show you, um, show you how, to, how to make a diagram of this. So the diagram was he started with 10 coin in wallet XYZ at a dollar basis each. And in GHI wallet, he had 20 um, of the DE coin and it was $5 basis each. Well, when he sold six out of XYZ, but gave them $5 basis rather than a dollar basis, he still has that 
after this transaction and by the end of the year, because let's say he did no other transaction before the end of the year. He still has $10 basis in XYZ, but six units sold times five is 30. He took 30 basis out of his GHI wallet, bringing that down to 70. So at the end of the year, his unused basis is 70 basis in GHI wallet and 10 basis. So he's got 80 basis and he's got uh, four coins left in XYZ and 20 in GHI. So basically he's need to allocate his $80 of basis among the uh, 24 coins. And two approaches are possible. One is, which is an example three, is specific, is just actually allocating it. And he can do it pretty much any way that B wants to, but he has to keep a record of that. That's one thing that's not real clear. What exactly should this record look like to show that you truly did this by January 1st, 2025? Because no one would want to have the situation was, I think I did it right. A couple years later, revenue agent comes along and says, no, that's not a valid record. So it's one of the things uh, we're going to ask the IRS, could you confirm exactly what you want documented? You know, like, do you need to get it notarized or something? So continuing on uh, from example two, he's done, B has done some kind of an allocation. And then on March 1st, 2025, with this new allocation of what he's done, and example three is using what's just called an allocation. There's also the possibility of doing what's called a global allocation. It goes on to example four, which I will leave for you to uh, take a look at. Um, so what he did at January 1st, 2025, or by January 1st, 2025, and somehow, you know, set in stone, that's what his basis was of the $80 of basis he had, unused basis, and the 24 coin, coin he had, um, he decided that in the four units that actually were an XYZ wallet, two of them he'd give a dollar basis. And whatever that basis is, it ties with the acquisition date. So that has July 9, 2019 acquisition date. And he says the other two units in his XYZ wallet are going to have a $5 basis. Then in this un GHI wallet, which still has 20 coin in it, he says eight of those are the dollar basis with the July 1st uh, date and the other 12 are the $5. So he has allocated this. And when he sells on March 1st, he actually is going to sell two units in the XYZ. So he has to, under the regs, match those with other coin DE in that same wallet. And what he does is he decides he sells one of the $1 basis and one of the $5 basis. So I know that's a lot to go through. Hopefully that will help you get through at least the first three examples. And hopefully the IRS is going to say a bit more uh, at the the moment I'm recording this, early August, the FAQs on virtual currency have not been updated to even note that there's this rep proc. That's something we also put in our comments that we sent off to the IRS last November was update the FAQs, at least put a warning in there. Hey, what this described in like questions 39 to 41 will not be allowed uh, after uh, 2024. You have to do an account by account or you know uh, wallet by wallet approach on that. Um, I'll leave you with the um, quick outline of the regs in the 6045. There is a lot there, a lot to cover in a short, <laughs> a short brain brain bite here. Um, but thank you for uh, listening to this. We will certainly have more on this, but we don't certainly want to highlight that this is looking like something you clients are going to want to do, and usually checking with their um, most people with a lot of digital assets are using some kind of a software tracking program. See what that software provider is going to do to help uh, with this uh, implementation of the RevProc, assuming they've been using a universal approach for um, identifying their, their basis of their assets. And please look forward to part two of a quick brain food update on some other items to know mid-year by uh, Greg Kling. Thank you.